On the 16th of June in 2022, the Australian energy market operator announced that it had suspended the spot market in all regions of the national electricity market. And AMO said that it had taken this step because it had become impossible to continue operating the spot market while ensuring a secure and reliable supply of electricity to consumers. That's a historic event. A few days later, the 22nd of June, Professor John Quiggan wrote an article in Conversation where he said that the national electricity market is a failed 1990s experiment and it's time that we return the grid to public hands. Uh, so what I want to look at in some depth is what caused this failure. Can the grid be returned to public hands? Uh, some problems associated with the energy sector, not just electricity, but also gas and transport fuels that Australia faces, and also some potential solutions. First, some, some good news. Is there a shortage of energy? Well, no, Australia is actually blessed with being a country with some of the most abundant energy resources in the world. Uh, but one of the ones that we don't have much of is oil, but we've certainly got plenty of coal, gas and many, many times that the amount of coal and gas in renewable energy resources. We're rich in that. We've also got some uranium, of course. Renewable energies are now the cheapest electricity in the world for electricity generation. And this graph shows solar down here being the cheapest and the wind is the blue line coming right down as well. And in Australia, they tend to be even better, cheaper than those lines show, because this is a world average. We happen to have an excellent solar resource. So this graph is averaged, including across Europe and other parts of the world. We're far sunnier than Europe, for example. So the cost of generation uh, becomes much cheaper again. We're currently at 30% supply from renewable energy on the national electricity market. That market includes Cairns through to Adelaide round to Port Lincoln, basically. So uh, the eastern states round to um, South Australia. We're on target to be 80% renewable energy supply uh, to our electricity grid by 2030, which is not very far off, uh, because the growth in the application of those technologies has been so great. All the state governments are now on board. In the past, that hasn't been the case. It was the feds who have been the blockage recently. We've now got a change of federal government who are now supporting renewables more so. A lot of industry is saying we've got to transform the whole energy system as well, including heavy industry who are coming on board progressively with this concept of hydrogen, as particularly using hydrogen as a source of energy uh, for heating applications, large-scale industrial applications. The neoliberals, what did they promise us? Or what, what did they want to see happen in the 1980s? Well, firstly, they say the market knows best, small government is better, get government out of the way, less or no government regulation, let industry self-regulate, uh, and of course, low taxes. And we've seen the mess that they have created uh, in many sectors, not just the energy sector, but in the water sector, in the health sector, right across many countries now. They also promised cheaper energy, more reliable systems, and better customer service. And I'm going to look at those three things. This is the sort of structure of the electricity system um, that we had up until about 2000, which was largely large coal-fired power stations, a couple of big hydro plants, uh, and smaller gas-powered stations, which we call peaking plants, they only operate for short periods of time. <coughs> And it was a one-way flow of energy from the big power stations to the end users, the homes, industry, and so on. This is what we've now moved to. It's called the distributed energy system, where we still have some of these big generators, and we have some big solar and wind farms out there as well, now feeding power into big transmission systems. But in the distributed power system, which is in the towns and cities, we have all this rooftop solar stuff, uh, and we have a lot of commercial buildings. Um, if you have a look at the top of IKEA, it's absolutely covered with solar panels. Uh, so all of that power actually makes the energy flow in two directions, becomes bi-directional, uh, in different parts of the distribution system as opposed to the large-scale transmission system. So it's a very different system, and we're starting to add into it 
battery storage, and we'll also start to add more what we call pump storage, which is where we pump water up high during peak amounts of solar and wind energy, and then we let that water flow back down through turbines to generate power during less sunny or windy periods. Uh, so the batteries are there for short-term peaks, and the, the pump storage system, like the, the snowy mountain system, is going to be there for uh, much longer periods of poor wind or solar conditions. So it's a very different system that we've moved to. Now the Hilma reforms of uh, the 1990s were aiming to pass on the risk uh, to the market by privatising. Uh, it was meant to increase efficiency and productivity uh, and it was driven by two states in particular, Victoria and, and uh, South Australia and to a lesser extent adopted in New South Wales and even less so in Queensland. So there was uh, electrician co electricity commissions in each of the states were corporatised. Um, they were vertically restructured and generally the generation, transmission, distribution and retail sides were all separated out. So for example in Queensland we've got the generators are uh, companies like um, CS Energy and Stanwell. We have the transmission is PowerLink, that's the really big high voltage power systems. We have Energex looking after the distribution system and then we have all this plethora of retailers that we go to to try to negotiate a good deal for ourselves. So that's what happened to the electricity systems and there was a bunch of trials I did first. They tried to get rid of some cross subsidies uh, and supposedly it was going to be independently regulated. So we saw firstly the Labor government, Kerner government and then later the Kennett government um, jump in on this to privatise in Victoria with a lot of the assets sold off. Uh, and then of course Labor progressively backed away from it a bit in New South Wales and particularly in Queensland. It started to become seen as a bit of both an electoral um, and economic poison. So there was a, a bit of a backing away from it in those states. What was ignored in the equation right through this whole period um, was the external costs of using coal and gas, fossil fuels as an energy source. And these um, external costs relate to the pollution, not just greenhouse gases, uh, but if you look at coal, it is absolutely full of toxic materials. It is nature's way of storing nasty things away down in the earth that we should not uh, have ripped out and started burning. Um, so if you look at the costs associated with pollution from mining, uh, from power generation, uh, from air quality reduction and finally rehabilitation, it is billions of dollars have to be spent tidying up the mess that this industry has created for us. It's six billion dollars alone in Queensland to try to uh, rehabilitate the mines, existing coal mines in Queensland. That's a huge cost to the state. Our royalties are typically about two billion per year from the coal industry. Now this graph is the one that really shows it all. It shows what happened to the retail price of electricity calculated back in 2018 dollars uh, over time. So the first period there from the 1950s is the public ownership right through until the end of um, the 90s, 1999, uh, and there were economies of scale that were achieved through building very large coal-fired power stations over that time. Remember, we're not including the cost of pollution and cleanups and so on in any of these retail costs during this period of time. So the actual costs are higher to society. A little bump in the middle there was a high inflationary period. And then we come down to this flatter section here where we move into the privatisation process and of course some of the economists started to crow that well that shows you that um, privatisation is working and there was some rationalisation of, of assets that occurred and then we saw a big rise in costs associated with the building of the distribution network in particular because we had very high population growth rates in Australia. Um, so we had enough generation capacity by this time, in fact we were over 
supplied with electricity generation, but we didn't have enough poles and wires getting the power to all of these new homes uh, and businesses that were setting up. And then we move into this last period down here where there's a whole range of converging crises occurring, uh, which is where we are right now. So the mid uh, 1950s through to the mid 80s, we see the economies of scale with very large state owned generators, large coal hydro systems with these gas peaking plant. And we also had some um, cooperative own ownership of sugar mills which generated quite significant amounts of power during the Prussian season, which was about six months of the year. Uh, and we saw towards uh, the end of the 90s and into the early 2000s, a whole stack of new power stations being built, uh, which ended up creating an oversupply of electricity. So we ended up with an oversupply of capacity, but not enough poles and wires, to push that power through easily to all the new suburbs and so on. So during that period, 89 through to about 2008, various economists, particularly Simshauser, who is currently the head of Power uh, Link in Queensland, and he was um, previously Director General of Energy, um, he was suggesting that all these wonderful things happen under privatisation, uh, and that reduced the costs to Consumers. It actually just maintained the map of a fairly steady state up until about 2008, and then it started to go to zero. So we saw an oversupply of capacity cleared because um, some of the very old machinery was retired. Unit costs reduced because we started to get better um, availability to increased use of the existing newer plant, and some new investment flowed. Some risk was taken by investors, but mostly in southern states because that's where most of the privatisation happened. And reliability pretty much was maintained. Now we go into the region of post-2009, so this is this region up here and onwards. Uh, and what we see is this population growth, higher demand for energy, people are building bigger houses, um, particularly an increase in air conditioning. In fact, Houses that were getting air conditioning were subsidising, or were, were being subsidised by people that weren't air conditioning the houses, mm -hmm. to the tune of about seven thousand dollars per air conditioner unit. So there was this massive um, uptake of energy, particularly air conditioning, through that period, and as a result, the distribution system started to get overloaded during peak periods. So that needed more upgrades. So a lot of money went into what was called at the time gold plating of the distribution system. There was a lot of criticism that it was being overbuilt. And in some cases it definitely was. Now there are problems associated with trying to project into the future what energy demand is going to be. And if you think about the coal-fired power station, its life is 40 to 50 years. It's a very large chunk of power generation in one go, 2000 megawatts compared with the wind farm, which might be 200 megawatts, some of them are now 500. But they're very large units. And so you're trying to ensure that your projection is right way out for this period of time to make sure that you're getting a return on your money to pay this thing off slowly over time. And that's a very hard thing. It's basically guesswork. And industry, the electrical authorities at the time, often got it wrong. And part of it was that they would often underestimate or set very weak targets. DSM stands for demand side management, where we're trying to shift energy from peak periods away from peak periods to off peak periods. They would often overestimate what the peak was going to be, but then underestimate how much they could save by these demand side management processes. They failed often to take into account energy efficiency. Now, this is because lots of engineers who build big things like big things and they don't like going around changing 500,000 light bulbs <laughs> uh, or getting people to use laptops rather than mainframe PCs, which uh, laptops use you know, 30 watts instead of 150. So we do the same job for you. So all of those sorts of measures weren't particularly taken on board by planning engineers. They tend to be very conservative people who don't want to fiddle with human behaviour. They just want to build you a big plan big power lines and not look at the demand side of the equation. They also failed 
to recognise how popular solar PV on our roofs, as we call solar rooftop PV, would be. When in 2000 we changed the rules and allowed people to start putting solar on their roofs. And people had been saying through surveys for the previous 10 years that we want our energy to come from renewable energy sources. That was from surveys in the early 90s telling us that's where people wanted to see their energy come from. But the planners and the engineers weren't looking at that and of course suddenly we see this huge big uptake of solar PV which has some consequences for the flow of energy through the grid as I said before it actually starts a two-way flow. And that has um, implications for how we manage voltage and frequency on the electricity system. So <coughs> there's lots of other factors that were starting to contribute to costs as well. And uh, a couple of them here were tightening of the reliability standards and also bushfire standards because we started to get those big bushfires coming through, particularly 2019. Um, increased financing costs, particularly to the privatised part of the industry. Uh, after the GFC, because they couldn't borrow money at the same interest rates that uh, government could. We saw what we call non-cost reflective tariffs, that's where the electricity cost of providing it to the end user varies throughout the day. Um, and this graph shows you how that might happen. This would be what we call a time of use tariff, where we charge different rates for different times of the day. And that would more fully reflect the cost of generation um, over a day for a house, for example. Now, those sorts of tariff structures have been available for a long, long time, but they haven't been imposed on the general public by um, government, primarily because to do it politically can backfire. And Victoria had the experience of trying to introduce time of use tariffs um, back in the late 90s and really burnt their fingers on. And they also started to roll out what are called smart meters, which are required to be able to use these types of tariffs. So, but from a straight economic rationalist point of view, this is what makes sense, not the way we currently charge for electricity. We also saw some um, retail confusion. So what happened with productivity in the electricity industry? Well, it actually fell. What we saw was that the ratio of managers <coughs> to workers actually decreased. We got more managers in there, we got more professionals in there, uh, and we got uh, more marketing staff. Because as soon as you have all these multiplicity of businesses out there, whether they're retailers or whether the, uh, the main big company has been subdivided into different sections which have all got to market themselves, suddenly you've got to have all these other personnel uh, in there and of course, the companies were split sometimes, particularly the big ones like Origin, NG Australia, AGL. They were split into a retail arm and a generation arm. And the power transmission distribution side was taken off. There was increased capital costs as well as inflation, uh, asset inflation, particularly in the private sector of the industry. So all of these things add up to additional costs in the privatisation system that have to be paid for by the consumers. So this is all these compounding factors happening and starting to push prices way up. On top of that, we have the complexities of changing climate, a rapidly changing climate now. Um, I think probably we have seriously reached some, some tipping points. Scientists won't uh, come out and tell you that yet, but there's certainly very, very concerning that that's probably what now has happened. Uh, with, when you start to look at the Antarctic and Arctic regions and see how they're heating critical quickly. Increasing weather variability, which has an impact on peak demand, which has an impact also on the cost of supply during those peak periods, and whether or not we've got enough capacity to meet those periods. So we're seeing both very big spikes in temperature at times, pushing a big demand for electricity right up, and we're also seeing some very cold snaps as well. And you get floods, they have impacts as well. The management of the national energy market is becoming increasingly complex. And just to give you one example with hydro systems, in the recent very wet period that we've just had, 
the pump storage systems in the Snow Mountains, where we're pumping water from one dam up to a higher dam and running it back down through the turbines. The bottom dams were full, and so were the top dams. And the rivers down below that the water goes into were also full. So then the manager of the system had to say, well, are we going to release water from the top weir, which would normally flow into the bottom weir, but it can't because it's already full. So we've got to dump it into the river. If we dump it into the river, we're going to flood someone downstream. So suddenly you can't use the, 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 the big pump hydro system because we've got this extreme weather event. Now that is particularly a problem if you put all of your pump hydro system in one place. And that's not what we should be doing. We need to distribute it all the way up the coast and there's been some really good work showing that there's enough existing dams with locations above it that don't impact on streams and so on um, that can be used for pump storage about 15,000 sites all up the east coast of Australia. We also saw that fuel costs are linked to global prices, so if any of these companies were purchasing coal on the spot market, some of them have long-term contracts, so they don't have to worry so much about the variation in the price of their coal and gas, but those that have to buy some from the spot market were getting hit with enormous increases in both coal and gas prices. There was some reduced availability and reliability, particularly due to aging coal and gas plant. And on top of that, we have seen a disorderly exit of some of the old coal and gas plant. So not particularly well planned as to when it's been taken out. We've seen a war between Russia and UK to stabilise um, the uh, energy system of the world, the prices, and of course a pandemic causing worker shortages and supply chain issues. On top of all this, we've got this horribly hierarchy and very complicated regulatory system. You'd think the neo would try to get rid of this. It's a complete um, contradiction to what their fundamental beliefs are. We have the Australian Energy Market Commission. It sets the rules. We have the Australian Energy Regulator. They enforce the rules. We have the Australian Energy Market Operator, and they go out and actually operate the system. They're the people who do the real work. On top of this, the Morrison government, when they, we had a big scare down in um, South Australia in 2016 when there was big blackouts, and all, they introduced a thing called the Energy Security Board. So this was another layer of bureaucracy on top. Now, of course, all these people uh, are bureaucrats, uh, are well paid, uh, not necessarily independent from industry. If you look back through their, like, what their backgrounds are, often come out of interests in industry. And some of these groups, particularly this one, is often in opposition with what it's trying to do to what these two are trying to do. This one's actually trying to transfer us to a renewable energy system sensibly and work out how the hell we're going to do it. It's got a thing called an integrated system plan over the next 20, 30 years. And it refines that the whole time. Uh, and these guys really are just getting in the way of it. With rules that in the past have suited the coal and gas industry, but not necessarily helped the renewables industry. So this is the sort of, um, all the layers that we've got, which have added to the cost of electricity in Australia. So what happened to reliability during this time? Well, reliability, uh, how is it measured? There's two main things. One is the duration and frequency of outages. Um, and another one is how much generation is there available at any one time in order to meet demand? Because we have to match the supply, the demand for energy with the supply of energy. And the demand is varying. It's always varied up and down. But we've also got some variable renewables feeding into that. And then we have these old generators like coal and gas and so on feeding into it as well. Most outages are of short duration. We have basically still a very reliable energy system by international standards. But the measurement of outages does not include the effect of extreme weather, which does tend to skew the data. And we're seeing more extreme weather events 
uh, so that data is getting more skewed as a result. So this graph just shows you for the distribution and transmission system how much of the outages were caused by the distribution system, which is the dark blue, it's almost all of it. And that's basically the poles and wires through the streets, and that's trees falling down on it. Typically, that's, that's what's happening. Occasionally, you get the failure of a major transmission line. And this is what's happening with insurance costs as a result of extreme events. This does not show you the 2019 fires or the recent floods in North New South Wales. It goes up to about 4.5 billion. The recent floods in Northern New South Wales, I think the figure I read was 10 billion. So we're just seeing these insurance costs go up and up as these more extreme events occurring. That's the payouts to all the people that have been affected by the event. The media loves a good blackout. The little bars here show you the typical reporting over time uh, where the pale the yellow here is articles that mention wind, solar and renewables or intermittent sources of energy and the darker bit is articles that do not mention wind, solar, renewables or intermittent energy sources. The big change occurred right here in 2016 where there was that massive blackout in South Australia and the Murdoch Press, which hates anything to do with climate change, it's, they certainly, the Murdoch Press certainly went to town on renewables after the big South Australia blackout. What happened there was a massive storm front came through with embedded tornadoes. It knocked down 23 major transmission lines, just flattened them, um, or transmission towers, I should say, on a major transmission line. When that happens, you lose an enormous amount of power on the grid, uh, and it becomes unstable. And what you've got to do is turn off parts of it to try to maintain the stability. If you can't turn things off quick enough, then it cascades right through the whole system. And that's what happened. Wind farms started to shut down, and then the gas turbines shut down and a whole lot. And because the wind turbines shut down first, the Murdoch press jumped on that and said, oh, look, this is the problem with wind. So they're able to handle a bigger fluctuation now in both frequency and voltage if a, a large event with loss of power occurs. Uh, but in this particular case, everything shut down. The Murdoch press jumped on. This study, which I think was by the Grattan Institute, showed that the Australian electricity grid is still a very reliable system. The most vulnerable plant on the whole of our electricity system now are actually the ageing coal and gas plants, and in particular, when we get hit by extreme heat waves. Because the efficiency of coal-fired power stations and gas plants drops during heat waves, they struggle, basically, to handle the power requirements at those times. As a result, we've seen some catastrophic failures. About a year ago, we saw Calide C, which is 825 megawatts. That's a very large uh, chunk of power. It was taken out of the Queensland grid, and thousands of homes lost power up in central Queensland. They're not quite sure why, but they think it was to do with the cooling circuit. It was a relatively new power station, and that's the remains of it. It basically completely blew apart this massive turbine. Uh, in the turbine house. When you lose a big chunk of power like that, you're going to suffer blackouts because it just happens so quickly and you have to shut down parts of the grid to keep the rest of us with power. We've also seen shortages of coal occur during flooding of mines, both in Queensland um, and in New South Wales and the Hunter region. And often the railway lines get damaged as well. So what they're trying to do is stockpile more coal right beside the power stations in order to give them more days of reserve of coal right on site. You can see all that water there with the coal sticking out. All coal, as I mentioned before, has got arsenic, that one's going to but it's got just about every um, toxic material in it that you can think of. But what do you think they do with that water? They have to get rid of it. They have to empty the mines. And they just pump it out. And the solution is called dilution. So we just pump it out into our streams and it goes out into the ocean and over our coral reefs. And that's the solution. So they claim that because it's dilute enough, it's not that, but that's not what the environmental science is. And this is just an example of one of the towers um, that fell over in South Australia in that, in that uh, extreme event there. Now there was a book written by an academic, Sharon Bedder, uh, in 2003. It was called Power Play. And she was exposing the problems of privatisation of the electricity industry uh, in mm. America, 
New Zealand, Australia and the UK at the time. She was already pointing out all of the issues that, that I've been talking about were being highlighted in this book, even right back then. And she basically said, if we're going to privatise, then these are three things that privatised companies um, don't particularly like or, or basically don't want to do. One is that they don't, they loathe to build what we call reserve capacity, <coughs> which is extra capacity that's there in the event of extreme events. Um, in case we lose power stations on part of the grid or we've got a really big peak in demand because of a heat wave. The, the current market system, any market system, rewards companies during power shortages. That's because they're able to bid into the market at much higher prices when there's shortages of power and make massive profits in a very short space of time. The price, the average price of electricity across the grid, the wholesale price, is typically about seventy dollars per megawatt hour. It can go as high as fourteen hundred dollars per megawatt hour, from seventy to fourteen hundred. So, just in a half hour period, they can make millions of dollars. And they can sometimes scam the system. It's called price gouging by limiting or restricting when and not being clear as to when they're going to actually feed power into the grid. So they basically can scan the system and then suddenly put it in there and get reward very handsomely. Mm -hmm. Also, the market encourages premature retirement of older assets. So companies that want to make a profit, and that's the purpose now of a privatised energy company, it's not to provide you with so clean reliable energy, it's to make a profit for the shareholders. Um, they are going to want to retire ageing plant sooner. Get off their books. It's a bit like opening restricting oil supply to keep the price up. Yep, exactly the same type of thing. Yeah. Okay, what happened to customer service? So we've looked at two things now. We've looked at how prices have become much higher under a privatised system for a whole range of complex reasons. We've looked at how reliability, reliability really hasn't changed much but we're facing issues with reliability as we shift into a more unstable climate, um, which is causing management of the whole electricity system more, more difficult to manage the system. What happened with customer service? Well, too much choice, too much complexity. Uh, I don't know if anybody's looked at trying to swap from one retailer to another and just what you come across is that they don't make it an easy pathway forward because it's difficult to make direct comparisons. There is a website, government website now that helps you. Um, but they, their bills are all shown in different ways. The discounts that they apply to various sectors of your bill are often different, different rates, different parts of your bill. So it's not easy for people to um, compare bills, and it was particularly bad at the beginning of this whole retail mm. privatisation boom. It's got a little bit better because we've got some online tools which help you to do that. Uh, but that resulted in a whole stack of disputes. And so what did we do then? We had to set up these ombudsman services in every state. And just to look back at 2000, the first, 2022, the first six months, 5,600 complaints along in Queensland. So is this good customer service? Well, Choice did a survey in 2022, and this is what they found. Unfortunately, as you expect, uh, there are some pretty ordinary companies out there, and you might be surprised to know that some of the biggest players are among the worst. And among the worst were AGL, Origin, and Energy Australia, the three biggest. Those three companies also have at times formed almost a power cartel, very similar to the gas industry in Australia, because they control 60% of the supply of electricity to the market. So they can really push the market in directions that suit them. They're amongst the biggest polluters because they own most of the big coal-fired power stations and gas, and they've been accused on it quite a number of times now for market manipulation, this is they call price gouging, where they try to push the prices up to benefit them. 
Now, the Australian Energy Market Operator has this thing called the Integrated System Plan, which is a transition to renewables. It's a long-term strategy. Uh, under the LNP governments, they didn't like what the AEMO was doing with this plan because it was too strongly pushing renewables forward because it was looking at what is the future. We have to get out of coal and gas. We can't keep doing what we're doing to the climate. So but we, we saw a, a backlash against them under LNP, who were, of course, supporting the gas transition. Uh, and sometimes the AEMO, the operator, was at odds with these other bodies I mentioned that before, so that often caused some delays in getting good results with the regulation of the whole system. So why do we call this an energy crisis? Well, I think it's probably become fairly apparent by now. Um, we've seen firstly that privatisation is really a failure. Uh, and the, at the same time has been a failure to integrate climate and energy policy. And of course, there's this famous event in the Parliament where Morrison picked up a piece of coal um, and walked into Parliament House with it. And it looks as though it's going to clout um, um, Malcolm on the back of the head and Barnaby saying, go for it, mate. Um, so there was a complete failure to integrate climate and energy policy under the Conservatives, we've seen more extreme weather, which has added stress. We've seen this aging infrastructure in the coal and gas causing us problems. And we're now seeing a whole range of converging issues internationally, from globalised supply chain issues, dependence on China. We have quite a big dependence on really heavy machinery parts in the electrical industry, in the water supply industry, uh, pumps and valves and these sorts of things, which have all been outsourced. Uh, to, to China to make for us. Um, even chemicals like um, water purification chemicals, we have very limited supply of those and, and very little ability to manufacture them in Australia. It's already good. Mm. The pandemic, of course, is still causing worker shortage and mentioned the war before, mentioned the, the, price, uh, the prices of coal and gas being linked to international. Now this shows what happened at, um, this is about two years ago, and it was a study done which showed how much of generation capacity from coal plant or gas plant, mostly coal, was offline. It was about 25% at this particular time. So if we had been in a situation at this time where there was a huge demand for energy, we would have been in real strife. And this is because a lot of these old plants uh, were being taken out for unscheduled maintenance. So this number four here represents AGL, number four, AGL. Um, Liddell, 2,000 megawatts of power lost because of unplanned maintenance. Number three here is number two unit offline, which is up there at AGL again. Our origin is number one, reduced capacity due to coal supply and coal spot plants. So they took a whole stack of power supply This is what the price of coal has been doing, and, and if you look at, at oil and, and gas, we're seeing a lot more volatility in energy markets. Uh, and that comes through to the Australian market because that's what we have linked to that international market, and we have to purchase energy from that energy market. Now, I want to just talk now about um, the other two bits that I mentioned at the start, which is our transport energy oil supply, and also I'll go up to gas afterwards, problems with that. In the transport sector, again, the prices linked to international prices, we have little control over. We have little remaining conventional reserves unless we want to go out into the Great Barrier Reef or the beautiful roof areas of the, uh, of the um, Great Australian Bight. And start mining for oil and gas underwater because uh, we don't have any oil left to get it out of the ground on the mainland area. You can convert coal into oil if you want to run your transport fleet, but it's a horribly dirty process to do that. Very um, pollution intensive. 
We've got little reserves held in storage here. We're meant to have a thing called 90 days of net import and cover. We've got 55, it was increased about two years ago. Um, but to get most of it here, it takes about 30 days. And a big part of the storage is in the southern part of America. We did a deal with the, southern, with the American government to store oil over there in their reserves. And that means we've got to bring it through the Panama Canal across the Pacific Ocean. It takes 30 days to get there. In reality, if we look at what's actually available to us to use in Australia, we've got something like 25 days of petrol if there's a crisis and about 20 days of diesel fuel. So it's not a lot of reserve. So if you think about our transport system, how quickly it would grind to a halt under those conditions. And we'd still be waiting for the ship to arrive with more uh, oil to be a service driver. Now, conservative groups like the Institution of Engineers, they've all pointed this out to government over many years now. Uh, that these are issues that we should be changing. The neoliberals say, well, we've diversified the whole supply chain, we can get chain, uh, ch training pathways to bring oil here, um, so we can get it from the Middle East, we can get it from um, Singapore, Korea, wherever there are refineries uh, that could use too. The gas industry, what's happening there? Well, the gas industry, of course, is pushing the whole hydrogen issue because they can uh, use to some extent their existing infrastructure uh, only though for very low levels of penetration of hydrogen, about 10% hydrogen added to, to, to the gas pipelines. But the whole green gas thing is still a very high cost to generate hydrogen and it's quite some years off before we're going to see that really drop in price. It's going to need a huge amount of infrastructure being built People like Pudding Forest are pushing this really hard. Um, it does make sense to keep pushing in that direction for large-scale heating applications, steel, cement production, that sort of thing. It doesn't make sense to use hydrogen for most transport needs uh, because it's very, very expensive and difficult to store in uh, sufficiently small space to get enough energy for long-distance aircraft, for example. The, so the, the gas industry says, oh, let's just go to green, green gas, not that simple, very high cost, it's going to have to be publicly subsidised to a large extent. Uh, they, they say that we need more supply, well, we don't. There's tonnes of gas already drilled everywhere across Western Queensland, New South Wales and so on. It's just that we choose to export it all uh, and then buy it back at higher prices than what we could supply ourselves. Western Australian government many years ago decided that 15% of all the gas generated or mined in Western Australia must be available for market consumption at reasonable rates. The East Coast didn't do that and we're trying to, to do some sort of deal. Uh, now we've got the scheme now which is not nearly as effective to try to address that. The gas industry say the market is working, of course they would, so don't interfere with it, but that's not actually the case. It's pretty much a cartel of about four big international companies, and pretty much the profits go all offshore, they pay bugger all in tax. If you go and have a look at Michael West Media, it does a wonderful job of tracking what these companies actually pay, and it's a pittance to it. And in terms of jobs, just to give you some idea, the mining industry in Queensland is about one and a half to 2% of all direct jobs in the state. And it's about 10 to 12% of gross state product. Now they're the two measurements that are most important in terms of measuring both the, uh, the contribution to the state of those two industries. 10% of gross state GDP, it varies from year to year. Uh, I think it's about 12% at the moment. Uh, and about 1.5 to 2% of direct jobs. It's not the thousands of jobs they can add on where indirect multipliers, but you can do that across any mm. industry in terms of uh, multipliers. <coughs> okay, let's look at solutions. Well, I'm going to um, 
put forward the solutions that John Quiggan has proposed um, at this stage. And these are the, the main issues that he said. He said, firstly, we've just got way too much complexity in the, in the management regulation of the electricity industry. We need to simplify it right down to one government agency. Um, so that agency, he argues, would buy wholesale electricity from generators uh, and would sell that electricity directly to customers uh, or to electricity retailers. So that's his, his number one solution. That's the role of government. The next thing is that we use these things called power purchase agreements. These are long-term contracts between a generator and a consumer. Um, and they set the price, availability, reliability over a period of time, typically 20 years. So that uh, big companies or homeowners have got the guarantee of that's the price of your electricity over that time period. And that's done through these things called power purchase agreements and the generators would all competitively bid uh, into a process of a power purchase agreement. So there might be say 200,000 megawatt hours required for a particular area and so all these generators out there would say okay we can supply this amount at this particular price and it would be a market process to get the cheapest. But notice that it's also availability and reliability are uh, important numbers of uh, um, conditions as well. It would employ what's called the merit order dispatch method, where the generator that can, the generators that consistently produce electricity at the lowest prices are the first to be called on to supply. So they're given the first priority to be into this, this market system, and that leads to lower prices for consumers. Yes, the ACT government has done this extremely well. They are basically now 100% renewable energy powered for their electricity uh, in the ACT. Um, Tasmania is the other one, but that was historically all hydro. But a lot of countries are doing this. Germany, for example, uses this uh, type of market mechanism. He's suggesting returning, I think he needs the transmission and distribution, this is my interpretation of what he said, he didn't spell it out particularly clearly what I read, but returning the transmission and distribution system back to public ownership. And that the guiding principle for this whole electricity system now should be to decarbonise the energy system. Because that's the problem that we're facing. Um, if we don't decarbonise and we destabilise the economic system through massive impacts of global uh, heating, uh, then uh, you know, we haven't addressed the real fundamental issue. We've got to get rid of this test that is currently used, which is the net market benefit test, and shift it to a decarbonising test. Now, I want to just briefly look at um, some other models that are out there for particularly generation and retail. So assuming that we've kept, we've taken back the transmission and distribution into public ownership, we've still got all of these generators out there. I've got solar on my roof, so I'm a privatised little power generation system here. <coughs> um, what do we do with IKEA? Well, again, they're privately owned. So we've, we've got a system which is fundamentally full of small privatised systems of varying sizes now with some bigger ones which are solar and wind farms. But we can also have those solar and wind farms, the bigger ones, under community ownership. And that's what's starting to happen. So this group in, in Hepburn set up a wind farm to supply their local community. And they got people to invest in it and they sell power to their local community. Similar thing happened in Denmark and WA. There's now a solar PV system starting to be set up with different um, places, this Nigeria Valley, um, and these two towns here, Yakin and Danida, and Lismore. So you can go online, you can check these, these things out. I'll make this whole PowerPoint available as well. 
um, so Dean can be nice and healthy. And you can follow up on some of these things and just see what communities are doing. And people are doing this because there's a whole range of benefits that come to their local community. They're maximising their local ownership and decision making. So that's a, a, a democratic process that's occurring within those communities. It also means that a lot more money stays in their local communities because they create some local jobs, people spend the money there. They can use resources efficiently and, and more sustainably. Because they understand their local energy demands, uh, they can better match the energy production uh, with local needs and circumstances. And of course, if we're using renewables, and energy efficiency measures that's all helping address the climate crisis. Now there's one other sector that I think could use possibly a similar model. Now that model is often based on cooperatives being set up, energy cooperatives being set up in various communities. You could do the similar thing with the farming sector. Now I don't know that, I, I'm just speculating here, so this is just me um, hoping that something like this might happen. Of course, a lot of small farmers have gone by the way. We used to have lots of farming co-ops based on a whole stack of small farmers. Solar and wind can both be integrated into the farming community. The wind farms are already happening on grazing land and in Europe often on uh, <coughs> cropping land as well. Um, but particularly in Australia, it's on grazing land. And the farmers love it because they get a lot of money off the generation of power from the wind turbines. It's anywhere from ten dollars to $20,000 a year off one turbine. Now, if they've got three turbines on their place, that's thirty dollars to $60,000 a year of relatively secure income. So if their crop fails, they've still got a second income source. We could be doing similar things, though, on a larger scale with multiple farms being cooperatively um, joining together um, and operating power systems across their farms. So you can do it by putting the solar panels up higher so that tractors can get around here, you can have fruit trees growing underneath them, uh, you can have small crops, you can be grazing animals around them. You can, these panels actually can be set up strategically to help shade the ground during the hottest part of the day so that it helps both retain moisture in the ground uh, which helps microorganisms, which in turn helps the grass grow better. You can do a similar thing with solar panels on large greenhouse, um, where they act both as a power generation source and a shading source to stop the greenhouses from overheating. And you can even use big solar rays on water, which reduces the amount of evaporation uh, and provides power generation as well. Now I'm suggesting that what we should be doing is these sorts of things, but in some sort of cooperative democratic process is how we employ them and uh, manage them. I don't have all the answers, but it's just me um, just thinking about it and hoping that maybe that's how we can go in the future. For those of you who have worked at the University of Queensland, I used to in the past team, certainly did it from a few other people here. They are now running off 100% renewable energy for all of their electricity, not their vehicle fuel, but certainly for their electricity. They bought uh, this solar farm up near Warwick. It's 64 megawatts. It's enough to provide about 25,000 homes with power. Uh, it's on 155 hectares of land, uh, and it has about 600 sheep grazing there on that as well. Uh, and you can go up there and visit. They've got a visitor centre. You can go and try it. It's worth um, going and having a look. They will actually do um, presentations to community groups if you want to arrange something with them. So, what are the conclusions? Well, the neoliberal privatisation model has failed. Uh, so, we need to see some sort of return to public ownership as much as we can, but I think to return the full system to public ownership, because we've got so many small and bigger private owners, including all of us who have got it, so uh, that's a difficult task. That would mean the government would have to buy back our solar systems on our, on our roofs. 
we certainly need to return the transmission and distribution system back to public attitude. Uh, and we need some sort of new functional model for how all of this is going to operate. The current system, just um, commentator after expert now, just constantly keep coming out saying the system has failed, we've got to revise this whole system. And I think the community owned model is one that certainly should, we should be looking at system um, very, very, very seriously. Both for townships, cities, as well as for the agricultural sector. And just to finish, I just want to show this because there's often a big myth about how the whole of Australia is going to be covered in solar panels. Well, if we were to replace all of the existing coal fired power stations um, that we're going to need out to about 20 uh, and supply power out to, up to about 2040 from solar alone, so it excludes wind and, and rooftop salt, just with big solar farms, we need 120,000 hectares, which is 0.016 of the total land area of Australia, and that's basically what that little chunk on the screen there represents. So it's not like we're going to cover the whole of Australia. And even if we built some huge solar farms in northern, northern Australia and sent power across to uh, I want to ask a question about the political economy of renewables. You've given a good explanation of how neoliberalism has caused a market failure in energy, producing a global crisis and one that is evident here in Australia. We should remember that most of that neoliberal experiment came from federal and state labour governments. And even though we were under a national party government, in 1985 when they tried to introduce private contractors in CQEF, what was then the CQEF was the main distributor, and it was the Labour Party opposition leader who negotiated and turned on the lights by lying to the power operators that the CQEF workers would get their jobs back if they'd only turned the lights back on. That's in Gladstone and Swamp. Mm. So we've got to be aware of the perfidy of the Labour Party, which is now in power now. That's why I call it a political question. Yeah. So getting to the question, Professor Quiggan has given us a fairly stock standard Keynesian response to neoliberalism. That is, it's a mix of private enterprise and public repurchase of distribution systems that were sold by Labour, state, and federal governments back in the 80s and 90s. So he's, he's trying to introduce a new form of regulation with his one body uh, as opposed to the six or seven that you outlined there. But I wonder whether it's possible that the Keynesian response would work, especially given the fact that we're currently in a supply side economic crisis globally. And one of the aspects of that is that anyone who owns a motor car knows that you just can't get parts, especially electronic parts, um, but that's across the board. Renewables are high tech, very reliant upon microchips. There's a worldwide shortage of microchips as part of this supply side where all that's happening is that demand is outstrips supply. The war in, in Ukraine will grind to a halt if they can't get more microchips to uh, deliver their missile systems and to destroy it. So, is renewables caught up in that global capitalist problem where it, it, it's reliant upon a, a global order which is in crisis and can't solve even basic problems like said the fixing up your your motor car, basic problems like said the fixing up your your motor car. Well, the answer to that is, is yes. <laughs> uh, uh, short answer. Um, Sixty-four dollars. <laughs> Thanks for the short question, Ian. Yeah. Uh, well, I have to explain it. Yeah, yeah sure. Okay, yeah. so, yeah, right. I mean, I, I think capitalism is in crisis right now, um, and in a whole range of ways, it's completely mismanaged the economies of the world. 
that's why we have a global both um, biodiversity collapse in ecosystems. That's why we have uh, a climate crisis. It is it's completely over-consuming the resources of the planet that are on a sustainable level. So capitalism is in crisis. And yes, John Quiggan doesn't have, uh, he's, he, as you say, he's, he's just put, putting forward the, the, the classic um, Keynesian. I don't know whether it's completely Keynesian, is it? Because I would have thought under Keynes, all, the whole of the electricity system would have been public ownership still. The Not in the New Deal. Not under the New Deal. The New Deal is Keynesian. And it, right. uh, it's partly driven right. by the fact that the public purse is going to give to companies who right. employ people. So. Yeah, that's okay. really what's happening there yeah, too. Okay. So, so you know, I, I look at um, research from scientists, um, particularly from the Stockholm Resilience Institute, and they look at what are called planetary boundary layers, or planetary boundary systems that we need to operate within as humans. And we're current, there's about nine that they define. One is the climate system, one is the nitrogen system, the carbon system, the hydrogen hydrological system, um, aerosols in the atmosphere, um, land use, and so on. There's all these, and they say that humans have to operate within boundaries within the planetary system. And we're already outside about four of these planetary boundaries as best they can measure. Certainly with climate, we've gone way past it. Uh, with nitrogen cycle, we're well past it. There's massive areas of oceans now which are basically dead because there's just too many nutrients and they become deoxygenated. Um, the Gulf of Mexico is an example of that. So if I, if I look at the big picture, it, to me it's not particularly rosy um, at all. And I, I have got friends who, are, who have children who are saying, you know, I have second thoughts about why do I bring my children into the current world. Um, so I think we, humanity is facing some huge issues. Is capitalism going to get us out of the mess? I don't think it is, because it's fundamentally based on a premise of infinite growth. And that's, you know, a 3% number is generally what they throw around. Well, if you have a 3% growth of the current economic system, you double all of the resources that we need to consume in about 23 years. It's an exponential function. Um, so it's pretty scary stuff when you start looking at what it means in terms of exponential growth. And, and the, um, the Club of Rome identified this uh, in their Limits to Growth paper. If you go back and read that original scientific paper, it's, it's a fascinating read because it tells you that they put together a very sophisticated model which didn't rely on linear extrapolations of the future, had all these feedback loops built into it, and, and quite accurately predicted, which is not what they aimed to do. They were just making projections into the future. They really didn't. They just said, if we continue on this business as usual, this is probably where we're going to end up. And that's pretty much where we've ended up when you go back and look at their data. 1970s. Early 70s. And they revised their data in the 90s and early 2000s. Again, with very sophisticated modeling. Um, so the warning signs have been there for a long, long time. But of course we're dealing with power systems, aren't we? And that's, that's the struggle that we've got as, uh, as the basic human beings trying to fight big, powerful forces um, that control a lot of the economy. I'd just like to say a few very short final words in appreciation of what a terrific talk that was. And what an unusual mind, I think, uh, Trevor's got. Oh, yes. If you're in my political generation, you kicked around a lot with people who were saying things like, one solution, revolution, <laughs> and they weren't saying, smash the state. You know, now, Trevor would have been a very convenient guy to have around at that time, but now it's, <laughs> that, that was in the 60s, but now it's uh, 2023, and I think that talk has demonstrated that you can be against the capitalist system, but to be against it, you're going to have to master a hell of a lot more detail, you know, like with a vague kind of pseudo-literary, you know, narrative mind like mine, you can't help being amazed at 
the capacity to produce that talk. It's like you've got to have three to three dozen different perspectives to master the detail. It reminds me of the kind of guy that if you're having a drink and you, you drop it on the floor and it smashes into smithereens and there's water, there's lemonade everywhere and fragments of glass and a, and a completely saturated carpet and your instinct is let's clean this up and put it in the, put it in the rubbish tin. He's the, guy, the kind of guy who says, no, wait a minute, I can analyze the pattern there. <laughs> by using reverse photography, I can actually reconstitute the glass with the drink in it. And furthermore, I can then tell you why you'd be better off drinking something else in a different kind of glass. <laughs> you know? So I'm always amazed because I've now listened to Trevor about three or four times, and I always start off by taking notes. And after a bit, <laughs> Two minutes, I stopped taking notes because <laughs> it's absolutely impossible. Yeah. But anyway, I just want to appreciate uh, the amount of effort you put into stuff, but even more, uh, what an extraordinary kind of approach to the world you've got to have to produce that, which I think is crucial yeah. at the present time. Yeah. So I'd suggest we give him another round. Of applause.